Hello, hi everyone. Um, just waiting for a couple more people to trickle in. Um, we just need eight people um to get a quorum, and usually they come within like the first five to ten minutes. So fingers crossed. <laughs> um, otherwise we'll have to cancel the meeting, which is a bummer. Um, but yeah. Um, let's see what we have. Okay. First thing we have is introductions, and I'd like to. Put that in the chat to get started but i'll give it a couple more minutes for people to join in and then we can get started do i sound okay can you guys hear me well great good okay thank you how many people have rsvp genesis um we had i think it was nine um it was eight to nine which is good because it is what we need for a quorum. Um, there we go. Admit. Um, so it's gonna be a smaller meeting, but it's okay. I, I like those. You get a lot. I got a lot of conversation going. Okay. Cool. Um, we have eight people at very at least so that's great we can get started um so first on the list is just a welcome um so i'm going to put it in the chat um name pronouns if you're comfortable um job or organization you're a part of um and sorry let's see um your interest in commemorative events historic preservation and why you're excited to be on a subcommittee so I can um, start off. My name's Hennessy. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, my job is to be the commemoration commission manager. So I manage all things this. Um, and I I really love historic preservation. So I'm excited to see what you guys what you guys come up with. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Suzanne. Sorry, <laughs> I'm uh, Suzanne Segura Taylor. I work for the Freedom Trail Foundation. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, um, and I'm excited to be part of this, this group of fine individuals who are happy and ready to commemorate Boston's wonderful history. Did I miss anything? No, it's great. Okay. I'm gonna pass it on to the next person. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, Ferris, introduce yourself. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Farris Gray. I'm the Sagamore of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. Um, really excited um, to be on this commission and to meet new people and create relationships. Um, and, and I think it's just awesome that um, that we can all be a part of this this um, commemorative commission. It's a big deal for the 400th. Um, so we're here just to um, well to make sure that the the history of Boston before it was Boston is included um, mm -hmm. with the rich history of Boston. So um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Trent. Good evening, everyone. I'm Noelle Trent. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am the CEO of the Museum of African American History, Boston and Nantucket. Um, we are here, we're participating to, um, we reflect the, the presence of early African Americans in early America and colonial America. So from 16th, 17th, 18th and 19th century mostly, and just excited to be part of this been part of a uh, 250th conversations, oh, I don't know, for the last six or seven years nationally. So it's great to be in that you're laughing, but it's kind of true, right? Um, it's just great to to be a part of something that can lead to some substantive action. Thank you. Matt? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Nat Shidley. I'm the president and CEO of Revolutionary Spaces. Uh, I'm also an early American historian. Uh, Revolutionary Spaces um, cares for and operates the Old State House and Old South Meeting House. So um, the revolutionary story is our bread and butter. Um, and like Noel, I feel like I've been uh, working on um, commemoration pretty much nonstop for uh, it feels like a decade or more at this point. Um, uh, but a lot of lessons learned. Um, I'm excited about this because I think we have an opportunity to um, leverage our city's amazing, rich, complicated history um, as a place to bring people together and to think not just about the past, but about the city we want to build for the future. Um, it's a great opportunity to bring people together around a common cause and, um, and demonstrate that history has transforming power. Amazing. Thank you. Juan? Hello, how are you, everybody? Uh, my name is Juan Osevi. I work in the W Boston Hotel. I'm also a executive board member for the Unite Here Local 26. Um, what I'm very excited is we're going to be able to show our beautiful his history, our beautiful city to everybody um, all over the world, and also show our beautiful country, the U.S., to, uh, 250 years. Uh, get the opportunity to people know Boston more than just why they see Boston comments, get to see the history and everything, and move Boston more out of downtown too, so people can see our beautiful city. Thank you. Thank you. Kona? Hello, everyone. My name is Kona Brunel. I'm a research fellow at Massachusetts Competitive Partnership. I'm actually representing my boss, Jay Ash, today. He couldn't make it, but I'm excited to learn more about what this commission does. Thank you. Um, Celia? Hi, everyone. Celia Risha with the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. And I'm so sorry I'm off camera. I have the stomach bug and I will spare you all this view. <laughs> um, I lead our policy and strategic initiatives, and I'm excited about this as a first generation Bostonian. I often experience Boston that's very different from everyone else, especially what people see in Wahlberg movies and The Departed. And I'm just excited to showcase that and how commerce especially has changed over the past few hundred years. Thank you. Sam? Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Tully Chambers, uh, pronouns he, him, his. I'm the public affairs manager at the Boston Foundation. Um, and I'm very, very excited to be um, part of this subcommittee, um, both also as a first generation Bostonian, but also as a former city of Boston employee. I'm very excited to tell the stories of Boston that many people don't get to hear. Um, and I'm excited to showcase what the city is as a whole and what we can be in the future. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, and Murray, if you wanna just quickly introduce yourself, that'd be great, thank you. Sure, it's Murray Miller, Director of the Office of Historic Preservation. I am interested in utilizing the power of historic preservation to uplift underserved communities and also to reach 
um, aspects of historic preservation that are not typically uh, associated with historic preservation, such as economic development, affordable housing, and climate change. So with that, I'm interested in hearing everyone's contribution and whatever I can contribute as well. Thank you. Okay, great. So the next part of the of the meeting is just logistics. We're going to go order of business. Um, Suzanne and Amari Jeffries, who couldn't make it, um, have both uh, volunteered to be the co-chairs. Um, so I'm just going to launch a poll and have you guys vote. Um, you can select both of them. Um, and once we do that, then um, Suzanne and I will be leading the meeting. All right. One second. I'll launch the poll and please let me know if you got it. Okay, great. All right. That concludes that. Um, Suzanne and, and Amari have been um, voted in as the co-chairs. That's great. Um, so <laughs> um, Suzanne and I will get started. Um, if you want, I can um, lead us into the, into the next section, which is um, scope, timeline, and defining of the events, exhibits, and trails subcommittee. Um, so, oh, if you guys need, I will actually send you the agenda in the chat just to have it available. Um, and that, there are some questions to help us help guide the conversation. Um, so what are the tools that are at our disposal? Um, what are the tools we lack? Um, what do we envision the events, exhibits, and trail subcommittee being and doing um, for, for 250, 400, and other events? Um, and what are measurable goals that we see for this subcommittee um, within three months, six months, nine months, and beyond? So those are some starting questions I'll put in the chat, but I'd love to get anybody started. Yes, Suzanne. Um, could we back up a little bit, Genesis, and maybe go over the um, update on any city plans or the legislation? Um, yeah, yeah, what, of course. Uh, yes, of course. Let me pull up the legislation, um, and I will also send you guys the legislation all right so the enabling legislation i'll send here chat the most important section for you guys is right here so the goals of the events exhibits and trail subcommittee include producing recommendations for events and exhibits that educate participants on the diverse history of Boston um, and determining how to promote historic anniversaries and acquire related public and private funds to benefit tourism, historic sites, and economic development in Boston, including by promoting minority, women, and LGBTQ plus owned businesses, and by supporting the formation of historical trails and tours that extend beyond the downtown area. It says, within the first year convening, the subcommittee shall produce an initial actionable plan of next steps in support of the commemorative events to fall between 2022 and 2026 to be approved by the vote of the full commission and presented to the city clerk. So that's the goals of the subcommittee. Um, where the city is now, um, I know that I and the Office of Economic Opportunity are partnering to try to um, gather information and see where where we are with funding um, and with other events that might be happening, like tall ships, that's usually, you know, already pre pre-planned. Um, but I can say that it's very it's in the very early stages. So there's nothing concrete yet. And it's just conversations. Thank you. Yeah. Um Thanks. just as a um uh, up uh, not an update, but a little more context. Um Genesis and Amari and I met to discuss the goals mm -hmm. before um, agreeing to chair, co-chair together. And uh, of course the fundraising aspect came up <laughs> right away that that's what one of the things we're charged with is fundraising for activities that that we um, that that uh, we 
present or or suggest. Um, and additionally, as we all know, Genesis is the one that we've been seeing and hearing from an awful lot. So Genesis is the only employee at this moment um, mm -hmm. talking about, I suppose, a little bit um, with other uh, divisions within the city about the commemorations um, coming forward. So there hasn't been any support as of yet from the uh, arts and cultural office or mayor's office of uh, sports, uh, tourism, sports and entertainment, correct? Um, tourism, sports and entertainment is part of the meeting, part of the group that I am communicating with under the office of economic opportunity. But it is correct that um, the office of arts and culture hasn't engaged with me or vice versa in a meaningful way yet. Okay. And then um, in the legislation, it also outlines that there's supposed to be a number of staff members that are going to be helping you, hopefully, Genesis, with all this. Is there any um, update on where the city is with any of those job postings? Um, uh, Murray, if, you, if you're on the call, um, I think he can he can help a little bit. He can speak to it. Um, but it, yeah. Um, I think the ordinance identifies two staff members for the commemoration commission. And my understanding is that those two staff members were appointed last year, one of them being Hennessy. And the other one, there is some indication that I would be assisting the Commemoration Commission, um, but that hasn't been fleshed out. So there isn't a plan or a budget to um, hire more staff, although it was raised during the budget deliberations. Is there a specific deadline that these, um, for example, that the dedicated staff need to be hired by or the budget needs to be in place by that we should be aware of? So the, the, the budget submission was due, I believe it was January 12th. Um, the ordinance doesn't indicate any kind of timeline for when staff need to be um, appointed, but there were staff appointed um, after the ordinance was uh, adopted. Mm -hmm. It's good to know. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, so that being said, I think that's a good segue into maybe what are the tools that we lack <laughs> um, and what are the tools at our disposal um, specifically for this this subcommittee because it's a, it's a lot. I mean, it's so been, it's, you're our tool. <laughs> I mean, it, it, to be perfectly honest, and it's outside of you, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot at this commission's disposal to make something happen. And given the tight timeline of what's in the ordinance, we yeah. don't have a lot of time to plan and execute. Yeah. So short of just being, for lack of a better phrasing, and it's six o'clock at night and I've had a very long work day. So I'm just gonna say, sounding like little busy mosquitoes in, yeah critical people's ears, it's not clear to me what the opportunities are. It seems like right. this is a group of highly intelligent, highly skilled people who can come up with some very strong solutions and proposals, but the absence of any level of funding from the city to execute this is yeah. going to make a large part of these efforts moot, right? Like yeah. and, and then you're putting the onus on creating an effective commemoration on the communities who want to be represented, and that feels right. to me. I mean, maybe I'm 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 maybe my my 
that I mean that's just kind of how it, it's coming off to me right now. And that so, if, if you look at what other regions are doing right now, we are grossly underfunded. Yeah. And so Philadelphia, Richmond, and Charleston are like, and that can tell you they're 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 light years ahead of us. So that's where my concern is in terms of tools we lack. There's only but so far this group can go, and the reliance of the effectiveness to execute this stuff is going to be pushed onto the communities that we're supposed to be impacting. Right. Dr. Trent, it's, uh, your point's well taken. Um, I had raised that same issue uh, when we were talking about budget, because uh, when the um, Commemoration Commission was established, there wasn't a budget. And I raise the fact that, well, the the ordinance sets out tasks, initiatives, opportunities. All of those are going to have a cost element, whether that is a human resource or a financial resource. And I was of the understanding that the the opportunity to introduce those cost items would be in fiscal year 24, 25, which is the current year that we are, are in. And so I um, did identify as much as I possibly could what things would likely have a cost element and suggested that there be a budget for that. And then I believe very late in the process, it was understood that every department was going to have to submit a level budget. And that made it very challenging for an entity that had been established to do certain things and make certain recommendations that wasn't funded. And so I did submit a budget request and attached the I guess I would say the evidence as to why there should be an exception, uh, given the fact that council had adopted the ordinance and that a budget was appropriate. So at this point, I wouldn't say that there is no budget because we did put in a budget request. We'll see what comes out of it by the 10th of April when the mayor brings down the budget. And I am hopeful that there will be recognition that this subcommittee and the other two subcommittees have an important function to play and they need to be funded. Thank you. <clears throat> what was the amount that the, the submission, is that something you can share at this time? I, I don't have the, um, the total amount um, at the at the end of my fingertips because it was broken up into a lot of different parts and some of those parts it looked as though the office of historic preservation would have a, a fairly minor role but we identified that we anticipated that other partners or other departments might do the heavy lifting and that we were then acknowledging that while we are asking for a modest amount, we are asking for a modest amount with the understanding that another department who has a larger role to play will ask for a larger amount. But I can get that um, information uh, to uh, the subcommittee for the next uh, meeting if that is helpful. Sam? Yeah, thanks. Is, has there been any discussions um about potentially reaching out to private organizations for donations yeah i mean it's i've been when i've talked to you know the office of economic opportunity and on tours and sports and entertainment um i think that's something that they're thinking about i think that's something that i'm thinking about their grants you know and I speak specifically because I just had the meeting with legislation and preservation tools and they have to do a citywide historic survey. 
Um, and that is going to cost a lot of money. Um, so, you know, outside of, outside of Cindy funding, I, I was thinking grants, um, anything that we could, we could rely on, including, um, nonprofit organizations for specific events. I know that the Office of Economic Opportunity would like to build upon, and I, I think this is, this is to your point, um, Dr. Trent, they'd like to build upon what's already there, what communities are already planning, um, and it does put the onus on the communities, and it is a little bit irresponsible um, of the city. But I think they they are trying to consolidate as much as they can because we're so behind. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I can speak to now. They they really have been thinking about it, um, and have been trying to figure out how best to collaborate with organizations that have funding, but nothing nothing concrete as of yet. Um. On that point, so with very limited funding, um, I think you know it, an entity like this, it, it, what the maximum that we can effectively achieve is to coordinate activities that the communities and institutions um, that we are connected with are already planning to undertake. Um, and from that perspective, um, the exercise of trying to raise funds for this entity actually, rather than supporting those um, efforts creates an additional competitor, right? So um, mm -hmm. as somebody who's responsible for fundraising at a nonprofit organization, yeah. our nonprofit may look like it's funded, but it's only funded to the extent that we can maintain um, a, a strong ongoing relationship with funders. Uh, and um, it just creates a more complicated landscape to have uh, an entity like that's that is a public entity stepping in and saying we also want to raise funds in order to support yeah. our activities. So um, I I think we should be careful about going too far down that pathway. Um, and given the time, we may think about our work in two phases, right? Because we have a series of 250th anniversaries culminating in 2026, and we have the city's anniversary coming in 2030, where we have more lead time, more opportunity to think about how we can actually build uh, a mandate for some public funding for this work because of the value that it will deliver to our city and to the communities within the city. Um, but in the near term, rather than scrambling and stepping all over organizations that are already working in the space, um, to try to go after the same funds, maybe we can think about how we can amplify their voices and and create, um, instead of just a random assortment of things, create a mm -hmm. sense of coordination among activities that are already underway. Right. Yeah. Um, gonna... Celia has her hand raised. Yeah, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Nat just said it beautifully. To, so just to build on what he said and, and Sam as well, I do think to start somewhere, I think it's us taking an inventory of what's already being planned. And then we can fundraise based off of what the city needs to do to supplement that with events and exhibits. Because if we're going, especially after private funding, it's for what? You know, we're not just raising money for this anniversary. People or companies at least are going to want to know specifically, what am I sponsoring? What are the benefits associated with it? We have to create very comprehensive decks. Um, and I will add, we've already, before this commission even started, I think it was last month, I heard from companies who were approached by other municipalities in the state mm -hmm. asking to support their efforts. And so Boston is already up against um, other municipalities who have started earlier yeah. for money from companies based in Boston or in the Commonwealth. And so not only are we uh, in danger of competing with the nonprofits who are hosting events and approaching private funders. We're up against other municipalities. And so I do think there needs to, uh, so I guess the question there also is, has the city been in touch with, you know, the Concord and Lexingtons of the world and others who are approaching the fidelities of the world for money? Because <laughs> um, that's when we think fundraising strategy, we need to be really careful um because if you if we go after a company and they're like well somebody else just already approached me about the same thing aren't you all talking so um if i may um respond to that celia as far as i i know there hasn't been any asks out yet um from the city uh i know that the state is also in the same position 
where mm -hmm. they will be accepting donations. Um, they can't ask per se, um, but they will be seeking for partners to um, help the state with a major event that uh, the administration would like to see happen. Um, more as a kickoff to all of what each of the towns and cities across the state are doing. So it sounds like we're all doing the same thing at the same time, but the what is not there yet. There's no concrete, like you said, ask, like, what are they going to get? Is it going to be a logo on a banner on every street in Boston? Um, so we've got a lot of work to do. And there's like, like everyone's saying, everyone else is doing this as well. So, um, but I do have a question for you, Celia and, and Murray. There is a, a, a line in the goals of the timelines, archives and curricula committee that says that that subcommittee shall produce an initial recommended timeline of key occasions to be the focus of the commission's commemorative work through December, 2030. So would we then be waiting for them to put the key occasions together before we can do our recommendations, which is three months later. Does that make sense? That does. I think I, I mean, I can answer a little bit that to that. Um, in their meeting, they were pretty clear on the fact that they didn't, if you guys are working in tandem, they don't want to make you guys wait. Um, so they were hoping to get the big 250 events out first. So that can be the focus um, for you guys and then start and then go into um, 400 and then go into other significant anniversaries. But they figured it would be not best practice to take three months to come up with an entire timeline. And so I think they're thinking of breaking it up and then presenting that to you, um, to you guys. And they were also wondering um, what would be best for you guys to be in communication because you, you're, um, goals are so aligned. Um, so they were thinking maybe having open, like an open meeting with, with you guys or having, um, just products and documents that you guys can view outside of meeting minutes. So like actual, um, some actual labor from them, um, that you guys can look at and, and comment on. So I think that's their thinking to not make you wait three months or anything like that, but to give you a front end and then keep giving you guys um, events that, um, a timeline. Noel. Yeah. So just a couple of thoughts in the discussion. Um, the first is to think about the fact that yes, there are a lot of organizations who have planned, but there's a whole lot of people who haven't planned and aren't aware that the conversation around 250 doesn't just mean 1776. It means beyond. Uh, that and the unfinished revolution. And so I think it would be um, unfair for us to only focus on those events or those organizations who've kind of been in these conversations and are like, we should do this, we should do that. Perhaps where we can begin to lay an outline is to think about what is it that we want the Boston experience of the 250th to look like where does it happen geographically within the city and when, right? Um, and so, and then perhaps considering if we know that there are tentpole events in the city, and I'm just thinking of this because I saw something about like BAMS Fest, is there something that we give BAMS Fest additional funds in 2026 to help make the event even more robust? But it then becomes part of 250th, but we haven't denied them anything, or if there's, um, you know, a carnival celebration or whatever, that we look at what some communities do annually, and is 2026 the opportunity that we add something to them, or we say this is happening, how can we make this more robust as we begin to build it out, but to kind of identify some sort of outline of something, because we need something there, especially in terms of events right, events you really can't wait to the last minute if we want national and international personalities to be involved, we got to start booking people now, right? So can we think about what do we know communities do every year, 
right? We know Lunar New Year, New Year happens every year. Does Lunar New Year in 2026, is there something we add to that celebration? Is that at the appropriate time? Maybe those communities want to do it at a different time. But I think those are the sorts of questions and outlines we begin to lay out for ourselves. So no, we don't have everything filled in, but we can at least begin to have some structure and allow people to see themselves in this moment and so that it occurs alongside Paul Revere and, and alongside, you know, the embargo on Boston Harbor and things like that. It's just a way for us to think about it a little bit differently. I'm glad you brought that up, Noel, because that was one of the conversations that I've had with uh, people at the state level is to make sure that we're, um, at, as a state commission, working with all the cities and towns. And I think we need to do that in Boston too, is make sure that every single neighborhood has a celebration. You know, I know that the mayor wants to be in every neighborhood and we want every neighborhood to celebrate and, you know, all that they have to offer. So this is, it's a great conversation and it has to happen. Genesis, one more thing about the legislation. I'm sorry I keep bringing it up, but I guess I looked at it with a fine tooth comb. In our in our section, it says that that um, that we're charged with putting uh, an actionable plan to support the commemorative events to fall between 2022 and 2026. Um, has anybody asked about why it doesn't say through 2030? No, nobody has. And I mean, I say with this ordinance, I say it's not that it doesn't have so enough you know, detail. Um, so I say, because it doesn't, what it doesn't say, it doesn't mean we don't do. Um, so I, I would say just because it doesn't say 2030 doesn't mean 30 isn't um, something we should be doing. Anybody else have anything to add to <laughs> what we need to do in a short period of time? Um, I know that we were, that was on scope, timeline, and def definition of events, activities, and trails, and we're talking about tools at our disposal, tools we lack, um, and a little bit on measurable goals. I don't know if we touched on that enough, if we think that there are goals that we could set for three months, or goals we could set for six months, or a year, um, but I might open that and see what you guys think, if you guys think that's not feasible for three months or anything. That's understandable. Well, personally, I think we need to meet with uh, the the other the other committee to see what you know they're thinking as far as the key occasions are, or you know what key occasions are they? Mm -hmm. And they don't have to be key occasions like we've been talking about. Like Noel brought up, we need to you know look at things that are happening in other neighborhoods. So yeah. it might be that we need to do more than just the key occasions, right? So maybe our three month goal is to meet with them a number of times and see if we can come up with a calendar. Mm -hmm. And of course the funding comes along with that. So we'll all be waiting for the budget to be approved. <laughs> yeah. Okay, my apologies to just taking some notes. Um, okay, so the the fourth thing we have is um, important topics to discuss. We, I think, have touched on it already. Um, it's what does fundraising look like or mean? Um, so I, th I think we've talked about some of that. Um, we also have 20, 2026 um, versus 2030. Um, we have, um, for example, call for proposals. Um, how can we put this in the chat? Um, 2026 versus 2030. Um, what can we accomplish for 2030 or what can we accomplish for 2030? How can we, you know, flesh that out a little bit better because 2026 is so soon, but 2030, I think, can can really be done well. Um, we have here, you know, city signage for important places, um, audits of trails um, for what's lacking on the trails already, what trails need to be created potentially, um, and collaboration with 
you know, the city, state, higher education, businesses, and other organizations, which I think we've touched on. Um, but I think what's important is um, how to make that collaboration meaningful and not like invasive. Um, and then, so we'll start, we can start that discussion in a little bit. And then there are some materials produced from previous anniversaries. I sent um, the 200 master plan over in the internet archive and you can download that as well. Um, and I just found some like newspaper clippings and some pictures of parades and things like that, that I wanted to um, show you guys that I thought might be interesting to see what they did. It's much different with, you know, no funding, but <laughs> um, I thought it would be, I thought it could be interesting to see if there is a way to take what bought, what 200, America 200 did um, and kind of be in that line of thinking. Um, for 250. Thank you, Genesis. <laughs> I, I just popped something in the chat um, for folks who uh, have not run across it before. It, I mean, it's it's not a very detailed uh, resource, but it's a, a tool put together by the American Association for State and Local History for thinking about how to leverage the 250th for um, more than just talking about 1776, how to talk about what's unfinished and um, use it to frame up conversations about we the people and thinking about how to how to celebrate all the work that has come after 1776. So uh, that might be a useful thing for people to look at if you haven't seen it before. That's great. Um, I mean, I have things like, for example, Tall Ships is coming um, in for 2050, for the 250th, sorry. So they're coming in 2026. They're going to um, New York, Boston, um, I think Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia, and New Orleans. Um, so, I mean, that's a thing. It's going to be for 250. What I was thinking about also was um, like Desire, the the ship that brought enslaved people um, to Boston and, and what it means to potentially have a meaningful, you know, interaction with, with that, with that legacy and the legacy of not just a, a port that brought in, um, you know, um, the the Europeans, but also a port that brought in that was a that was a a rich port because of slavery. Um, so I think it's a useful activity maybe to think about um, how what we already commemorate is missing something else. Um, it isn't telling a full story. Isn't engaging with for example, the port as not just um, a place where immigrants come, but also a place where people who were enslaved had to come through. Um, um, and I know, for example, everyone wants like, people are going to be tracking like parades. There was a, their big celebration for um, 19, for the 1976 200th. Um, but I thought what was really interesting that came out of out of um, the 200 book that I sent um, was this idea of a of a passport or a guidebook um, where um, they kind of tell you these are places you should visit. Um, here's like a passport. It has coupons. It has um, for restaurants, for hotels, for um, these museums, and it's a way to incentivize tourists who come to have a comprehensive history um, and a comprehensive way to engage with um, their environment. But I found an article that I also thought was pretty fascinating that, and I'll send it to you guys later when I don't have it with me, I just have um, a passage of it. It says, um, Boston 200 officials say that three publications should prove to be especially useful to the visitors. One second. Um, a discovery map details, um, a detailed guide with all the walking trails, the official guidebook containing 11 maps, information on everything from history to hotels, um, the passport. Um, but it also says here, the first child care center to be operated in a city 
in a city hall in the United States is another Boston 200 project. The bicentennial gives us a chance to think about the problem of childcare to raise a consciousness about it. So I thought that was really interesting that instead of just being about um, commemoration, it also took it, you know, they also took it upon themselves to think through issues that were facing the current day residents like childcare um, and, and opening that project in the city, in the um, city hall. Sorry, Ferris. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so, I mean, like, Tennessee, you brought up, like, you know, maybe having uh, more of a tall ships turning um, and things like that. Um, so there's like an elephant in the room when it comes to Boston. And I don't know if it's this committee's place or whose place it is to bring this up, but um, I mean, there's some things that that needs to happen internally with Boston when you're talking about um, commemoration and celebrating um, some of its history. Um, and, and so Boston has some difficult choices to make or um, these celebrations are going to be um, marred with protests. Mm -hmm. um, and I can just tell you like the tall ships, when indigenous see the tall ships, they just think of the colonizers. Mm -hmm. um, and they're celebrating their dominance in their, in their um, colonial past, which is always uh, a tough thing for indigenous people um, to see them celebrate in such a history. And so um, I don't know whose place it is to bring these issues up, but I mean, I think that Boston should address these things um, before they plan mm -hmm. to celebrate these things. Um, you got Faneuil Hall. Are they going to celebrate Faneuil Hall? Um, I mean, I, <laughs> are they going to bring ships to commemorate? You know, just to say, you know, we 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 were slave traders um, and things like that. And so I don't know, like I said, I don't know whose place it is to bring these issues up about Boston's past. But Boston's past, um, some of it is not to be celebrated. Um and so I think how Boston handles that leading up to any kind of celebration um, with these dark years that are in its path is really important. And if they choose to ignore it, that's just, I mean, they're just doing what their ancestors did. And so, I mean, I just like to bring that up and just, I mean, we, we have to ask about this elephant in the room when it comes to Boston and what Boston plans to do about it uh, preceding any kind of celebration. So I don't know if, it's been talked about or if it's just been ignored, but I think it needs to be addressed when you're talking about celebrating uh, Boston's past. Yeah, I mean, I think this is actually the the most appropriate place to talk about it and to discuss it. Um, and I think that's why, you know, they say specifically Boston 200 chose to be celebratory and not necessarily look into um, all of the bad things, but I think that that's part of it. So, you know, I took some and found some articles about the queen visiting, um, the queen of England visiting. Um, and she read the Declaration of Independence and it was a whole thing. But what I found the most fascinating about it was that there was a protest happening while she was here because of um, the occupation of, of um, Northern Ireland and the troubles. And, you know, so I, I think that what well, I liked that that was happening because it shows that Boston was being politically engaged. The residents were being politically engaged, even if the city itself wasn't celebrate was being celebratory instead of the more neutral commemorative. Um, but I think we have a chance to do something much more meaningful than just you know tall ships. Tall ships is coming regardless. But what what can we do instead? What can we do um, with what I said, like with desire, with um, this history that has been purposely obfuscated? But yeah, sorry, um, Dr. Trent. Yeah, uh, Hennessy, thank you for sharing Boston 200. I will say that in historian circles, our movement is distinctly away from what was done in 76. Nobody really wants to emulate a whole lot of that. There are some methodologies that you mentioned, like a city passport or something, but this idea, Ferris, as you mentioned, that tall ships is, aren't celebratory for everyone is part of that. So I would really... Um, I just want to back up that on this. I would really urge everybody to take a look at the Making History flyer. I think it's more inclusive in terms of an approach. Um, at the end of the day, it's about decisions. 
um, that we make. And so I think this is not a celebration. I do think that this is a commemoration and we have to enter into this with these sorts of thoughts. Um, to look at 2026 versus 2030 is for us to consider audiences, right? 2026 is really and truly a national and international audience who's coming to Boston, right? And it's not just because of tall ships, World Cup is holding some of the trials or something that's gonna bring an international audience. We don't, I don't think anyone's really thought that far in terms of international type events coming to Boston, at least not that they've released publicly to folks for 2030. So we don't know that, but we do know we've got these international and national visitors. And for some people, this may be the only time that they visit Boston. And so I think the question before us should be, if this is a family or an individual, that this is the only time that they're gonna experience Boston, what do we want them to walk away with? What are the complexities? What are the challenges? What are the stories? What are the parts of the city that we want them to see, that we want them to know, right? And I think that gets to the elephant in the room. I think that that gets to um, going outside of downtown. You know, I think it gets to that, but I think that should be the mentality through which we think about this, right? And so it's not a, this, we can have parties, but this isn't a party, right? And as recently as, you know, we, they talk about busing, but in our more recent past, there've been some challenges. So what do we want people to know? What do we want them to understand? What do we want them to walk away with? And where do we want them to spend their money? Because they're going to spend money and they're going to do it wherever we send them. So what does that look like? Yeah, that's a great point. And I think, you know, I've been getting, been engaging with um, residents and in certain communities who are very, very laser focused on a specific America 250, right? Um, on specifically like the, the uh, what we already know about Bunker Hill, for example, um, or what we already know about Dorchester Heights. Um, and that's where I think we can engage with communities in the way that they would like to be engaged with. Um, whereas this subcommittee has potentially more of a, an onus, more of a, a responsibility and potential and just an opportunity um, to not necessarily have to focus on those commemorative events and focus on, commemorative, on, on the events that have not been uplifted or not been um, celebrated or commemorated or um, even, you know, arch archived, um, entered into a written record. And I think that's kind of what the legislation, it's what the legislation is trying to get at. Um, so I think it's an opportunity to have conversation and dialogue in that way and, and have this be a more meaningful um, commemoration um, and a more meaningful set of anniversaries. That's my thinking behind it, but Matt. Yeah, I just I want to uh, I want to thank Noel for offering those thoughts about audience. I think that's really helpful. Um, and I I maybe just want to uh, ask us to consider that there are there are multiple audiences, right? There's that visitor from out of town, and I think it's really helpful to think about the experience we want that person to take away. What's the story that we want them to remember? Um, but I think we, the legislation also makes clear that uh, we should be thinking about our own residents uh, in, in our city as part of the audience as well. And the two are, of course, conjoined. Um, but, you know, one of the goals here is to make sure that uh, in the language of the legislation, every Bostonian feels ownership over and connection to the city's history and its full depth and diversity, right? And um, I think there's a, that will engage, that will involve imagining events and exhibits that will engage those local audiences in exploration. But I think we also ought to think about like, if we are speaking to the visitor from out of our outside of our city and telling them what Boston's history is all about and what our city is all about, um, we have to be doing that. We have to be imagining events that, uh, that, that 
our whole city can can feel uh, reflects their voice and their contribution, right? So um, it, it, that's where the intersection between those two audiences is. But we, I think, as we think about the the sort of portfolio of things that we want to put forward, uh, we need to we need to be mindful that there are multiple audiences. Yeah, yeah, and I think not only just mindful. I think we're the most important thing is going to be how to figure out figuring out how to engage with the communities who are invested obviously and have a vested interest in how they are represented and and how um and what their stake is in these anniversaries um so i think that's another component that's going to be very important yeah and i think that's the challenge cuz our timeline wants us to rush forward fast but um if this feels like an exercise in co-authorship <laughs> with the communities um, around our city who want to be involved and um, co-authorship takes time and building the infrastructure for that takes time. Um, and I, I hate the idea of putting out a plan before we've done that work, but w you know, we, we do have to move forward quickly. Yeah. And I, I can't say like I have done some preliminary, it's not great. Um, you know, we can always do more. I, um, but every time I do go out into community, I, um, there's a survey that I, I, I have people fill out, um, you know, where I ask like what what buildings, what things, what objects, what places, what people do you want to see commemorated? What communities do you want to see commemorated? And, you know, we've gotten a, really, a lot of really fascinating things. Um, and I think I should I can share that with you guys after this meeting, um, because it's just great to know what what they're thinking um, outside of actively working with them um, as peers. Um, people who are just interested and invested in in seeing things, but are not necessarily like active planners, because I think Boston residents are very opinionated anyway. And so I think it gives us a lot of good insights into into what people are thinking. So I, I, I'll send that out, actually. Um, Genesis, we also have, oh, go ahead, Juan. Sorry. So my, my question is, the when we said the 250, right? Um, we're celebrating the, uh, the U.S. history, correct? Like two two feet and then and twenty twenty three and then the four hundred is for the city of Boston uh for mm -hmm. two thousand and thirty correct mm -hmm. okay so yep. so I I just feel like we have to for the two twenty uh two thousand twenty three we have to make sure we connect Boston to the history uh of American because we're not celebrating Boston we're celebrating Boston in twenty uh two thousand thirty. Uh, 400 birthday so I, I feel like uh, I'm just thinking we should have that connection the birthday uh, American birthday um, 2050 so I, I, just, I don't know I just, just want to say that a little comment and also no, oh, I'm the, done. oh sorry about the fundraising like who's uh, we are the responsible to set up fundraising or who's who's doing fundraising like what's are we going to do like a dinner and invite people to come, buy tickets? Like, uh, who, who's who's running that? Um, so I think that's a question that we've been trying to, <laughs> to figure out um, because the city right now hopefully will give us something. Um, but, you know, Part of the issues that have been raised are um com we're competing we would be competing with um nonprofit organizations that are already planning things um we'd be competing with um other certified local governments who also want to celebrate America two fifty and and their own um to you know um towns events um and and like Dr Trent said there are also other organizations and governments that haven't that are well behind. Um, so I think the answer is we, it's tricky, <laughs> um, and that we are hoping to figure it out and consolidate what's already happening so as to not step on, on what's already going on, to not step on toes, but yeah. So who's... Genesis, can we use the commission with all of these wonderful people on it, um, to help us in our, our planning? Um, I mean, there's, there's people that are expertise in every, mm -hmm. every community on the commission. Yes. Yes. That's the goal. That's the goal that, um, you guys are able to cross pollinate 
in a way that's helpful and effective and making best use of every single person on the commission. Is Can there I... a list of the people that um, are these experts in each of these? Okay. Mm -hmm. are, yes, are you I can send it out with us. It, uh, yeah, I've okay, shared sure. it, but I can um, send it out again um, and I can add notes about um, what they do, what their organizations are. Thank you. This, After, this, sorry, Mr. This may be a real simple question, but I'm just going to ask it. Who's doing the planning around July 4th, 2026? Is that us? Are we, are we, are we doing it? Are we the ones you're going to say when someone, when NBC, CBS, C-SPAN, CNN come to Boston that whole few days? Like, <laughs> is it, it? Because, I mean, if we're just talking targets, timelines, big dates, there's one date, like we can mess up a lot. There's one date we can't. And the one date we can't, excuse me, I was eating my dinner, is July 4th, 2026. So does that mean if it's on us, does that now move it to a very high priority in terms of not that everything else isn't important, but if we're trying to say the city of Boston is doing this for July 4th, 2026, and we want to have all the people all of Boston and Hollywood in Boston. You know what I mean? Like, if this is what we're going to do, you know what I mean? And every Bostonian who does anything great between now and 2026, we want to add them to the list. Like, is this the moment that we're doing it? I know it's a simple question, but I just didn't have clarity. No, oh, and it's a actually, I think, a valid question um, because as far as I know, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, um, us and obviously sport tourism, sports entertainment, and economic opportunity, but there, those, you know, uh, the director of economic, of sports and tourism, and the chief of economic opportunity are also on this commission. So that's what makes me think, yeah, yes. <laughs> um, sorry, let me see. And Genesis, what, what um, committees are they sitting on, or they get to sit on whatever ones they want to sit on? They're on this one. Okay. They're on this one. They're not here, but they're on this one. Um, and and Amari is um Chief Shagun's alternate or designee, so they report back. But yes, so they're on this one, and they're supposed to, you know, be informed on on everything that we're doing here. And so they're on this one, and we also I have um biweekly meetings now so going forward set up with them. I, I guess one of the good things about um, about all, all these different um, people working together is that uh, many of you may know that Amari um, hosted an arts and culture summit in November um, and rolled out everyone to 50. So we're lucky to have him on this committee because um, I he's going to be able to help with with. Um, with all the people that he's already engaged with about the 250th as well. Yeah. Excuse me, um, and thank you, Dr. Trent, uh, for that really um, simple question it was about you know, the 4th of July in, in 2026. Um, and so I would just like some clarity. Um, is this the, the 250th? Is, is, do we know, is this going to be like a year long celebration, which can involve each neighborhood and each community? And I think it's really important we know um, where we're headed with this. Or is this like, um, like was said, is this going to be like a one, this one event thing where all the media is going to be there? Is this going to be the, like the, the apex of the celebration uh, for the 250? Because it's not just Boston, it's, it, you know, America, basically. Um, and so I think that's really important for us to know because, um, like if we're going to plan for each community to have their part in this celebration, um, that's not a one day thing. That's not a one shot. thing. That's more like during the year, um, that each community is going to have their celebration. Um, and so I think that's really important to know, um, actually what is Boston thinking? about 
this national thing that's going to happen. Um, because the 400, that's Boston's thing, you know? But but the 250, if that's like that's like America's thing. And so I don't know if each individual community is going to have a bigger role in, in that celebration as in the 400th celebration where Boston really celebrates itself. Um, so I think that, that um, I just would like some clarity um, on what Boston is thinking about the 250th. What does Boston want? Um, or do, do, do they want us to tell them that? Yeah, I, gosh. <laughs> um, though we're moving away from like Boston 200 or, or 300 or whatever, three Boston 300 was like the year, or 350 was like the year of Jubilee, where it was a year, they were planning it for year long. But I think that they had the infrastructure um, for that. Um, so it's difficult to say, but I think that it's what's, ex it, what, is, what is expected is a series of events. Um, and I guess that's, that would be us, but I also know that the sheer amount of labor that goes into planning so many events isn't, can't just be us, right? I think it has to be, there has to be vested interest, um, from other city departments and, um, but to, and collaboration with other cities like Lexington and Concord. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a tough question. Yeah, and, and we need to be realistic. Sorry, just real quick. We need to be realistic. Um, if we're talking two years, mm -hmm. um, so we're absolutely behind. So I mean, we should we have to be realistic in, uh, about what's doable in two years. Yeah, which is why I, I think Dr. Trent mentioned that maybe Fourth of July is what is the big thing that we we focus on and make that big and robust because potentially other events might fall to the wayside just because of time. Juan? Yep. So, <clears throat> so when you say it's us, like planning, like I'm a little confused because like, okay, what, what are we going to have? What, which, which money are we working with? Where are we going to plan? Like it's so much pieces we don't we we talking about that's supposed to be us well where's the tools um uh, what's the plan and so and another thing i was saying like you know is to fit the american you know it's a new america especially boston is uh you know um, you have dominican american haitian american uh, Cabo Verde Asians, I mean, like we we are very diversity city so uh, i feel are we going to show that the, the the you know uh the i think that's american you know the new Celebration the two feet the the American you know uh, different different faces um I, I feel like that's something it's not just community I feel community is, is like Boston when we celebrate Boston we can focus a lot in community but I feel like American we have to show what Boston is now you know it's, you know everybody always think about Boston one way and I live in Boston and I don't believe Boston is just that way it's, it's many different faces and i feel we should make sure which we, we show that in this celebration yeah and i will say the you know timelines archives and curricula um they're not very strict on their they're like 50 years is the benchmark they're not strict on that at all specifically because they know for example you know um you're dominican i'm dominican um we we came not not that long ago um and our history begins to pick up before or, or after 50 years um but that doesn't mean that there hasn't been significant contributions to the fabric of boston um and to the to the way that boston engages with um with us so i think the timelines our present curricula subcommittee is i think well adjusted and, and thinking thinking about how we think about our histories and how we think about the communities that have impacted boston but not being super, you know, giving a super hard timeline about it has to be 50 years or that's, or it's not historical, you know, because that's not how culture moves. It's not how things progress. Um, so I will say that they're doing well in that regard. However, um, and I should say, and that can be a good thing for this subcommittee to 
to think about um, how to plan um, events or how to support events that are happening, like Carnival, which actually just had its 50th anniversary this year, which I'm sad wasn't commemorated in a bigger way. Yeah, Suzanne. Um, when's the next mi um time timelines and the other committee meeting there? Do we have that? Mm, yes, it's in it's March fifth. March fifth at one p.m. And we're allowed to go to that. Yes. Okay. Yes, you are, and I can um actually send you all the invite as well. Um, or send you guys the agenda and and the, the zoom is the same link for for all of the meetings so um, but I can send you guys the agenda once that's finished so to just give everybody because I just did a little bit of googling world cup is June to July 2026 mm -hmm. tall ships is July 11th through 16th mm -hmm. So to really give us something to focus on, yes, we can take the whole year. We can start in April or March and go through September if we want to capture peak tourism. There's a bunch of different options, but I do think that in terms of giving us some goals to shoot for, because this is feeling very amorphous, I think we've got to look at June and July, what are the big things we're trying to do? What's the big messaging around that? I do also think that the thematically for this, the idea around a lot of the national conversations around 250th is not worried about if it's historical or, or not. It's about bringing it up to today. So the person who just arrived in the US has just a valid claim to being an American. And I'm not talking about documentation, I'm talking about experience and contribution to who we are as a society, as a person whose family has been here for generations and everybody in between. And so I feel like that's the best approach, but if we're talking about calendar target and giving us some framing, I think we need to look at if 2026, it turns January 1, 2026, What's our timeline? What are we hitting? Just to give us some, some. we know the high point is that 4th of July. Mm -hmm. But where, where do we, where would we like to see critical programming, messaging experiences happen? Is it a six weeks period? Is it eight weeks? Is it 12 weeks? I think we got to give ourselves some parameters. And would we be the ones, here's a question, thank you, Noah, would we be the ones to determine that time frame, or would it be the timelines committee? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think I think that might be you guys. I think that up to you guys, your discretion, because you guys are the ones who are um, having to deal with the bulk of events, exhibits, and trails. So even if they have um, an uh, events that they, or the timeline that they're working with because you guys are focused on the events. Um, I think that's up to your discretion what timeline looks like. Nah. Um, I so I I understand the the value of creating a, a kind of period of focus at the culmination of all of this, but I, I, I think we should also recognize that you know, a core part of Boston's story is the start of the war long before independence. I mean, in some ways, our 250th celebrations here in Boston have been going on since, you know, 2015 or or whatever. You know, we had the 250th anniversary of the Boston Massacre in 2020, and last year was the 250th anniversary of the Tea Party. But um, I, I do think the 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 world will be taking notice in 2025 of the 250th anniversary of the you know, the the Battle of Lexington Concord, which starts with Paul Revere's ride, and then there's Bunker Hill and there's the, you know, the the Siege of Boston. And I I I think we should we should imagine the 250th plan as a kind of slow build of momentum and interest that culminates with a big bang in the summer of 2026. But I, I would hate to just imagine that we we have to focus on on 2026. because uh, there's there's 
really the next big beat here is going to be in 2025. Yeah, my anxiety couldn't take thinking about 2025. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's right. a lot going on. It was on much right easier there's... to say like oh, 2026, sorry, but yeah. 2025 is basically yeah. so. If we don't figure it out in the next couple of months, it's going to, you know what I mean? And that's not to say that the sites that are affected by it aren't going to do something, but we right. got a real short window to do something. Yep. Make a statement. I mean, real short. Probably about four months, four to six months. Which is why um, I, I do I feel like it might be helpful for us to put on our work plan for relatively soon some conversation about the themes. Because I, I think you know, the, the easy thing is to think about the events. This thing happened 250 years ago. Um, but but how do we get to the place that we want to be at, which is that it's it's not about a specific date. It's about a particular part of the American experience that remains unresolved and that all of us can relate to from our own life experience. Like, oh, yeah, I've been part of those conversations. So like uh, for my organization, when we did work around the 250 of the Tea Party, a lot of it was exploring the role of protest um, in a free society and what mm -hmm. protest means. and. Um, cultural and artistic expressions of protest through a long arc of time. But, but th I think there are, as we think about like uh, what we want to structure our conversations and our commemorations here in Boston over the next couple of years, if we can have a set of themes that might make it easier for us to imagine like, okay, how do we, how do we make that into uh, how do we intersect that with a cultural festival or a music festival that's already taking place? Or, uh, uh, you know, what is an exhibit that um, that can connect that with a long arc of history? Um, so I, I would argue for for putting some conversation about that pretty upfront in our work plan. That's a good point. Um, okay, so we have 45 minutes left. I just wanted to flag that. Um, it's good. Um, and all we have left on the docket is just open discussion, public comment. I don't think. So, you know, anything else we want to talk about? If we want um, actually to set up a plan um, for next steps now. Thank you, Dr. Tran. I see you sending. Thank you, chat. That's great. Um, if we just want to make a preliminary um, plan for for next steps or anything like that for me to take away, for us to take away, that'd be great. And then we can go from there. Well, I think the first thing we should do is probably get a number of us to go to that March 5th meeting to see what's happening. Um, mm -hmm and get input from, from them for, before our next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and anything that you can tell us from the city side, you know, is there is there anything that the administration is saying that they would like to see? Um, because, you know, there is some uh, wants and desires from the administration on a state level that the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism has just, um, you know, heard about recently. So, or city council, if, if there's anybody in, in, you know, any of the counselors or the counselor's offices that, you know, have any, you know, strong ideas about what they'd like to see for us to, to you know, possibly entertain. Yeah. Um. That's a good point. I mean, we have um we have city council president um Mujan on the commission, but it would be a good idea, you know, to see if the city council at large is interested in sitting in on these meetings or is interested in um collaborating in any way. Well, it feels like we have an awful lot to do, like Noel said in a very short period of time. And the fact that we're sitting here thinking, what the heck are we going to do when we're in charge of it is pretty scary to me anyway. Um, we need some direction. Um, well, it, it feels like if we take Nat's recommendation 
that 2025 is very critical for some things happening here in Boston. And Paul Revere's ride is April-ish. Lexington April. Concord is when? April. April. Bunker Hill is what, April too? June. June. So between April and June of 2025 is a critical kickoff period for us. So we can give a sigh of a little bit of relief because we're not having to hit the ground running January 1, 2025. So we think about that, that our target for 2025 in terms of launch events or, you know, critical jumping off points. If we say April is around the time that we want to do that and it aligns with Paul Revere's, right? I'm not saying that it's got to be tangibly connected, but it just gives us a general space. It's spring. Who knows what the climate will be because of global warming, but um, or climate change? Then April gives us the target of what we're shooting for to start, right? Mm -hmm. And April and June, we can April to June, we can view as our kickoff, quote unquote, season, if you will. That gives us some idea of timeline in terms of where we want to start in twenty twenty five. That doesn't mean that things don't happen the rest of the year, but it gives us something to start with. I think thematically, I would recommend that we read the field guide and look at the first four, is that four? First four themes, I think are really easy for us to pull from in terms of what we think can happen in communities, neighborhoods with people. But if I think if we say April to June's target, then that gives us something to work towards because we have nothing right now. It feels very amorphous. That's just my my thought around it. Well, that's great, Noel. Um, Perry. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I mean, I like the idea of you know, it doesn't have to start with in, in twenty six. It can actually start in twenty five. Um, that's even less time <laughs> than, than than we have at twenty six. But I like that idea. So I think it's imperative that that we coordinate with like Concord, um, it like soon, very soon, because they're probably already working on something. I don't know if anyone's ever been to the um, Concord Museum and seen there. They have a virtual kind of reenactment of that everything that happened with um, the Paul Revere's ride, the British coming. It's it's only like a five minute interaction, um, visual interaction, but it's awesome. Um, it really gives gives the people that go. If you haven't been there, just stop by and see it. It's, re it's really cool. But I think that uh, we should coordinate. If, if this is the path we want to go, then we should absolutely going to have to coordinate with Concord to see what they're doing and how can we, how could Boston be a part of that? Because they're connected. We're connected. Uh, and how could Boston be a part of it? Because, I mean, it might not be, you know, we have to plan everything. We can just, you know, plan with them um, leading up to 26. Uh, I mean, I'm just visualizing, this is just me. Um, I'm just visualizing having a rider um, actually do that ride, um, you know, um, do that Paul Revere ride. Um, I think that would be extremely powerful, well covered, um, just to have them do that historic ride as a way to kick it off, you know? Um, so I mean, the, the bottom line is, if if the twenty five thing is what we're we're, you know, decide to go with, then we really need to talk to to Conquer. Um, see what they're doing. Um, Old North Church and Paul Revere House are actually in talks with folks out that way about the ride, and there's a lot of logistics of the ride, getting the horse on the boat and getting the boat to the house. There's a lot. There's a lot happening. I was just in a conversation with them today, but um, it's good to hear that you think that that would be powerful. Um, so I think that we can lend our support to those organizations as they're advocating um, for this with other entities uh, to make that happen. I think that that would be incredibly important, and we could always just lean on that as our ushering into our launch, right? I mean, that helps amplify them. And then we can figure out all the other 
pieces around it. Maybe there does this committee come up with, you know, prize for freedom, or is there some sort of artist performing art thing that we build in addition to that? Incidentally, that's Good Friday when that happens on April 18th. So it's a weird time of year. Um, but is there something that we do to lead into that, right? Is there, do we help sponsor artists to create artwork? You know, there's so many different great collectives and cooperatives here in the city. Um, that would be an interesting way to, to look at that. I like using that as that launch date and then it amplifies something locally and then it helps us stay local for a while. Yeah, thank you both. Um, and no, I've also been in uh, conversations with um, with um, Nikki and the Reverend and and uh, some other people up at the State House just yesterday about the ride, and we were talking about how really what we need is to um, get all the communities together um, to um, assist with this because it's going to be such a big task to get this force. Um, and person on the horse to do the ride through all the communities that 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 uh, he he Paul Revere goes through. So this is something that the city would be very helpful in, you know, working with the Boston Police Department and Massachusetts, you know, state um, state police and transportation divisions and all that. So that's how the both the city and the state can work together to pull this off. I know that the state is very interested in it. Um, so I, I think it's a great idea. It's already happening. So it's, it's, it's kind of an easy, not easy, but we can be, like you said, Noel, really supportive and push this through and potentially make it so that all neighborhoods in Boston are involved in it somehow and celebrating the fact that it happened, you know, in the hotels and, and restaurants and all that. It would, it would, be, it would be great as a, as a way to launch the next year. So, and even a reenactment of um, the Boston Mar um, Boston Massacre, um, that could be also equally as powerful. Because, um, I mean, we all learned about it in school um, as, as just a way to see, you know, um, just from what people said, you know, there's some, some people that don't know the whole story and don't, don't know exactly what happened. Um, and so I think that these are all really powerful tools, visual tools um, that can kind of, you know, set Boston apart from all the other celebrations, because um, these are real historic things that happened here in Boston. And, it, and uh, if we can reenact some of these things, that's really a powerful thing. Um, and I think that it would benefit Boston tremendously. The um the one of the conversations about this particular event is that they would start the ride at midnight, and my I my personal humble opinion is I don't know who's going to be awake at midnight coming out of their house to see this, and if we work so hard at doing this the right thing and getting everybody excited about it, the poor person on the horse is not going to see a lot of people at two a.m. and midnight riding through their towns. I don't know how anybody else feels about it, but I think it's a it's you'd, a be, lost... you'd be surprised. I know, I know. But... Surprise! Uh, an event like that, if it was if it was done right, and mm -hmm. if it was covered, they had good coverage. People would would wait for to see that rider go by. Um, you know, people love this country. Um, they love the resilience of this country. They love what this country ha has had to go through to get its to to take its own independence. Um, and things like that, you'd be really surprised on on who would show up or who might line the streets um, to see Paul Revere ride by screaming, the British are coming, the British are coming. Um, that's the kind of thing you might keep your kid up just to watch. Um, it is, it so, is a Friday. I, mean, I, I like it. I mean, it also is a Friday, so it's not like anybody got to, you know, most people yeah. will have some time off on that. Um Initially, I was like maybe eight o'clock, but I do think, Ferris, you have a point that people would stay up for this moment, right? And so maybe we lend our support to say, let's consider this and how do we do this safely at this hour, but also think about technology on how we can bring people to the into the experience, right? So at 200, you might have just waited to see it. 
but is there a way for people to have an experience with the rider? Mm. Do we do a Macy's Day parade sort of situation? Like where, in terms of this commission's opportunity to support this, um, what does that look like? And can we make it feel more contemporary? Do we intercut it when there has to be transitions? I don't know if horses, based off of animal law, do horses have to be changed out? Is there something that we can lend to have different sizzle reels or or filming or something intercut with it to make it this major moment for yeah. the country? Maybe somebody, like if, if there was a cam or somebody riding along filming it, like they have like the marathon truck and they're filming mm -hmm. rider the whole way and it's televised, people mm -hmm. might watch it from home that aren't going to come into Boston or Medford or Cambridge or or wherever else, you know, maybe it's something that we can work on to get it televised nationwide. That'd be pretty darn cool. Televised. I'm thinking live stream because Gen Zers aren't turning. Yeah, on. that's what I mean. That's what I mean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're not turning on the TV. But sure. I mean, if we if we think about that, and that's our opportunity to lend the resources of this commission, um, which at this point is just till we get some money, more influence. Maybe it's saying we want to support this. We want to get people excited. We want to help with the marketing and spreading the word. And then what is the thing for people in Dorchester or Roxbury to get excited about this? Because not everybody's a history nerd. Right. So what is the thing that we're doing? What is the incentive? What is the social media campaign or something that we're inspiring people to do? What is their cry? What is the What is the thing that they care about? that we want them to share in this moment. So everybody's buying into that. Well, one of a, I just thought of something as you're saying this, Noel, what if, what if, you know, there's a poem about Paul Revere's ride. Why don't we, you know, why don't we have like people write poems and recite, you know, recite poems. And I, I think it'd be a lot of fun. Any, any age could get involved in that. Um, so I don't know, there's all sorts of things we can do. Just yeah. thinking about sponsorships too. Ralph Lauren. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just about to say, you know, it would be great if, if it's going to happen, for example, in the North End, it'd be great if, um, you know, restaurants and the businesses in the North End were invested in it. Um, because like like you said, Dr. Trent, I'm, I live in Roxbury. If I'm not already in the North End while it's happening, I might want to go in, but the incentive there is is not as high. <laughs> um, and I might live stream it. But if, the um, restaurants and the businesses in the North End, if it's happening in the North End, are doing something. Um, I might, there might be more incentive for people right after work to go, oh, okay, we're going to go to this restaurant, or we're going to go to the tavern, or we're going to do whatever, um, and we'll wait for the ride. So, but what if, what if you got businesses around the city to be like restaurants around the city, not just the North End, like maybe yes. you create like a Paul Revere cocktail or whatever, and yes. someone can walk into any restaurant in, Boston that has this Paul Revere thing on the on the window that says Paul Revere's you know restaurant or whatever it is and you can walk in and say give me a Paul Revere or whatever it is I don't know yeah no that's a great idea mm -hmm. um, there's all sorts of things we can do but we still you just put businesses along the trail so that they benefit too and maybe we're calling these restaurants who participate like Revere Riders or something this is why you have marketing people you know what I mean? But but like, that's the thing. So there are these gathering spots because there was a gathering waiting to hear what this was doing. So what do we create? And then also making sure that we can feature some sort of artistic representation from different neighborhoods mm -hmm. across the city that are that is added to the broadcast of that. Then people aren't just watching to watch the ride. They're also watching to watch their community members? Um, is there an honor that we talk about people who bring recognition to community issues, you know, that that we have that neighborhoods vote on or something that is also featured as part of this ride in 2025, right? Like, I think that's the way that you get to a multi-level thing. So it starts out with Paul Revere, you know, founding father, but the essence of that is bringing rec recognition, doing the work when nobody else is watching, right? 
So who are the people in the neighborhoods from Roxbury to Jamaica Plain to, you know, all, all over the city, then people will go to the places in their neighborhood to see that, or at least gather together to wait for that. They're all great ideas. See, the longer we stay on the phone, the more the more comes out. <laughs> or the Zoom, I should say. Anyway. You're muted. I was on mute. Yeah. <laughs> um no, I just wanted to to ask um if we have anything more to talk about, if we think that we have some now we have something, you know, going, some meat going, or if we um should open it up to public comment and then um adjourn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually I've been I was thinking about this while we we're talking about um Paul Revere's right. It's very morbid, but Paul Revere writes about seeing um um a black man hanged on his ride and it's like a footnote in his in his diary, but it's like oh, this just happened and like we didn't talk about it. So I think that there's opportunities to even look inside of what's already there and see what has been ignored and how we could potentially incorporate that. Um, just one quick note on this. I, I, I think this is just an example of I, like, we just need to remind ourselves as we have great ideas about not setting ourselves up in competition with the entities that sort of are the core caretakers of those stories, right? We want to find ways to complement what they're doing and expand the reach, uh, but not in a way that is going to set us up in, in a way that is going to interfere with their own efforts, right? Like we've got a resource, which are a, a couple of great institutions here in Boston who um, have a strong sense of uh, ownership of that story, and we want to we want to support them. Um, and and as we go along, as we think about the whole plan, we're gonna we're gonna come up against that over and over again. Of course, we are, Nat. And you know, ever the just the Paul Revere uh, reenactment in of itself is being planned by Lexington, right. Concord, Arlington, yeah, right. and now Boston. So it's, it's they've choice. already started fundraising. <laughs> they've already started asking for you know people of of great stature to come to that. Um, and now Boston is getting involved in that um, conversation. So um, there's going to be more meetings, obviously. But, um, you know, I think some of the things we're talking about for just just that we wouldn't really have to raise money for. I threw out, for example, the uh, uh, Ralph Lauren thing, but I don't think we need to raise money for that. That would be an idea for the people who are actually planning this event. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, we have to be very, very careful about that. Definitely. I, I think so too, but I think a lot of what we've discussed is more of amplifying it, right? So the technicals and the logistics will always live with the entities here in the city and the other municipalities. But if we can say we, we support this and this is how we could help contribute to this is to leverage our influence as a commission to get it broadcasted. And we think a broadcast that incorporates untold stories, highlights neighborhood artists, highlights people who are doing this under-recognized work, but significant work in communities would help amplify the ride whenever they decide it would take place. I think that benefits everybody, but I think you do have a good note in that whatever we're doing, we're, um, we're always paying attention to what the lead organizations are doing and not being in conflict with them. And the good thing about us all is that we all work with those said entities. So we would never do anything to, to overshadow what they're already doing. And it would be something that we would have to have, you know, buy-in from um, all these entities, um, whether it's the National Park Service or 
you know, Paul Revere House, Old North Church and the like. Okay, so I think we have a lot. <laughs> um, we're gonna have a lot, a lot ahead of us, but it's good. It's gonna be good. <laughs> Um, so do so we have any, like again, I said again, do one more time. Do we have any final comments um, before we wrap it up? Yeah, just a question, because I'm just looking at the agenda and I noticed, you know, one thing that would, might help us work backwards for a timeline. So for example, there's on here city signage for important places. How, just knowing ahead of the, you know, next meeting, how long it would take, you know, if we were to say, you know, we want to highlight this um, location, this building etc and commemorate it how long it would take to develop approve etc fund mm -hmm. signage so we can work backwards from it yeah on average <laughs> <laughs> um and then my other thought too as we still as um, murray goes back on the budget a lot of what we're saying reminds me of something i did internally for a festival was which was to create a community pool of funding so we invited and um organizations who are already hosting events to, to join in this festival. But we also said, if you need supplemental funding to do so, let us know and we will give it to you. So I think we should think through what maybe a similar process could look like if we want to ask like the BAMS Fest of the world or I um, embrace ideas to add on something. Um, what pool of funding could they apply for and then who would be the grantors? So would this committee decide? Does um, the Office of Economic Empowerment decide um, what does that process look like? Mm -hmm. um, or if we're inviting certain folks, would we then just grant it? So that's just something to consider as you're reviewing the budget too. Um, yeah. Hopefully something streamlined. That's a great point and a great idea. So, I mean, hopefully it's almost it. Not all, it's not almost April, but April will come soon. So hopefully we'll we'll have some answers in that regard. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna take what I'm gonna do um for the, after this meeting is I'm gonna take everything that you guys, um, everything that we said in the meeting and also um everything that was suggested in the chat, um, compile that. This meeting will be available online on, on a YouTube page, and I'll send that to you guys. Um, and then I'll post the meeting minutes as soon as possible within within a week. Well, I personally, and I'm, I hope I speak for the whole committee, but thank Genesis for all your work. You've been working very, very hard as a one person band and it's a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. I know it's, it's hard to get you guys. You guys are so busy. It's hard to get you all together. <laughs> and I just appreciate you guys um, taking the time. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you guys. Um, if you, somebody wants to Make a motion to adjourn. Someone second it. Um, so moved. Right. Can I get a second? I think one second. Amazing. All right. So this meeting is now adjourned. Um, and I will reach out to you guys as soon as all of this is ready. And I really appreciate you guys taking time in the night, <laughs> in the nighttime after a long day of work um, to have this difficult conversation with me. <laughs> Thank It'll you. get better. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Good night. Good night.